Amen. You may be seated this morning. We're going to dismiss our children downstairs as well, trusting that the Lord will continue his work in their hearts. Grateful for those teachers and volunteers who support that ministry. So we pray God's blessing on them. Jeremy has often told me I have to open up more. And so here's a spontaneous opening up of more. Now understand when I open up more, that just means more. Okay? Singing that song reminded me of an interaction I had with my grandfather this week in the hospital. And I know many of you have been praying for him. So a spontaneous update on how uh, our brother, uh, Walt Ulig, is doing, and also my grandfather. Uh, he's not doing well physically, mentally. Um, he is, his dementia and Alzheimer's and all that is really accelerating and he's saying and doing things that you would have never thought you would hear from Big Walt. <clears throat> Thanks, Jer. <laughs> but here's an amazing thing. In the midst of all of his confusion and all the correcting he needed, no, Grandpa, that's not true. No, no. I looked him in the eyes and I said, what is your only hope in life and death? We just sang that. And at first he didn't want to answer. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Grandpa, what's your only hope in life and death? Well, I don't know. Then it was, I don't know. I said, Grandpa, what's your only hope in life and death? I want you to tell me what it is. And he was quiet. I said, you remember what you told my son last week, Silas? He's like, Yeah. I said, you told him to love Jesus. Number one thing in his life that was important was that he loved Jesus. It's number one. And so I'm going to ask you again, because you told my son this last week. So what's your only hope in life and death? And in a moment of memory and sanity, he said, Jesus. Amen? The Lord remembers. When we forget all, the Lord remembers. Anyway, back to the topic at hand. Again, James is concerned to help us mature in our words. Again, again, again. Are you getting it yet? Again, James is concerned to help us mature in our words. Again, James connects our words to our hearts. You remember that's consistent with what James' brother says, right? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Again and again, James speaks to a certain sin that manifests itself in what we say. How can our words reveal our sin? Today, he's talking about pride again. It seems like James really has some specific concerns that he wants to press in on with those who are reading his letters. Pride is his concern. How can our words reveal the pride of our heart? I want you to think about that for a minute. How can what we say, those words that come out, in what ways can they reveal a deeply embedded pride about who we are. For the follower of Jesus, we're concerned to ask this question as well. How can we live and speak with a greater humility that represents the Lord that we worship? Let's turn to James 4, 13 to 17, and let's continue on in our series in the book of James. James 4, 13 through 17. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. 
Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we pray your spirit would move in our hearts, would speak to us clearly, that we'd be able to remove all distractions of the concerns of the Monday through Saturday, 9 to 5, all that would just be set aside and that we would give our attention to you, that the Spirit of God would work in us, transform us, uh, strengthen us, nourish us, heal us, and guide us. We need you. Do a work by your word in Christ's name. Amen. June 26, 1990. Anybody know what that day was? June 26, 1990. Come on, guys, you know when you graduated high school. Okay, 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 close, no. It was my 11th birthday. Some of you are like, he looks 11. No, that was my 11th birthday. 11th birthday, June 26, 1990. And birthdays are a big deal in my family. They always have been. It is an opportune time to get something expensive. Right after all, I was born. Look at what I did. <laughs> Reward me. And so what do you think? It's my 11th birthday. I'm an a energetic, hyperactive boy. What do I want? What do I want? I'm 11 years old. What do you think? What do we got? Okay, a bike. All right, yeah, that makes sense. A bike. What else? What other typical birthday boy, 11-year-old boy gifts do we get? What do we got? Oh. That'll preach. A basketball hoop. What else? Jordans. Jordans. I mean, that was every year, right? Christmas, birthday, Easter. Isn't Easter an opportunity? That's a little messed up. Anyway, no, no, none of those things. Do you know what I wanted so bad for my 11th birthday? You ready? What every boy wants when they turn 11. A briefcase. That's it. I'm not lying. Ask my parents. I, I text my mom this week, do we still have that briefcase? And she said, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm like, shoot, I really love that briefcase. So I had to uh, ask my parents for a briefcase. They gave me a briefcase. And you know what I was intending to do? Replace my backpack. <laughs> Going to middle school at Liverpool with my briefcase. I'm not lying or exaggerating at all. And I did. I went to school first day. I walked all the way down the street because we were literally a block from Liverpool Middle School. And I walked right into the school with my briefcase, proud. I want to tell you I never brought that briefcase back to school ever again. <laughs> because one thing I wanted more than the briefcase was to be liked by people. And uh, I was made fun of. For whatever reason, I don't know what it was. I mean, I try to think back, why did I want a briefcase? I mean, I know to some degree, but I feel like it was maybe the, 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 uh, the effect of watching Secret of My Success. Does anybody remember that movie? Was anybody even alive in 1987 when the great Michael J. Fox was in the movie Secret of My Success? Raise your hand if you even know what I'm talking about. There's like three of you. Okay, great. <laughs> Watch the movie. It's fabulous. Secret of My, you remember Secret of My Success. I mean, it was like the whole 80s corporate culture thing, right? Dress for success. And so literally, I wanted to buy a suit. I wanted a briefcase. I wanted a day timer. I wanted like glasses and the suspenders. I literally wanted to be a businessman at the age of 11. I just did. It was ridiculous. But for whatever reason, maybe in 1993, a little bit later, uh, the, the, the movie The Firm kind of reinforced that, and I wanted to be an attorney. Now, Jeremy's the one that got to be the attorney. You know, I don't know what happened, but it wasn't me, okay? So I'm not a tax attorney. I'm not Tom Cruise. I'm none of the above. That's for Jeremy. But basically, that gift was something that represented a desire of my own heart. It wasn't the briefcase. 
It was an intention in my, in, inside of me. It was a desire that, that basically set me on a trajectory that based on all the influences around me and the desires of my heart, I made a commitment that I will be successful. I will be successful. And, and that briefcase was a symbol of success. It meant I was on my way. It was just the next step. And many, many of you think there were a lot of other steps before getting a briefcase. But for whatever reason, that's kind of how my mind dealt with it. And it's funny, I think of other relationships. Like I had a close friend who was really on his way to business. He was thinking like an entrepreneur at like 12, right? And we had these silly conversations that we're going to start a, a lawn mowing business. We're going to start a car detailing business. And one of the craziest ideas we had was... I know what we're going to do. We will open a putt-putt golf course. How ridiculous is that? We will open up a putt-putt golf course. It seems a little crazy, doesn't it? It seems a little silly. These freshmen in high school talking about opening up putt-putt golf courses and, and car detailing business and, 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 and landscaping services, how silly it is. I mean, if we just understood who we were, if we just understood the limited capacity that we had, the limited experience, if we just know who we were and what we were capable of, we probably wouldn't be coming up with these grandiose plans at the age of 14. Am I right or am I right? It's a little silly. An 11-year-old with a briefcase, freshman in high school opening up putt-putt golf courses, this is absolutely ridiculous, right? It's silly. Right? Right? It's crazy for people to be so out of touch with reality that they forget who they really are and they forget what limited capacities they have and they start making uh, distinct plans about the future. I will do this. I will do that. Right? People that are just clueless. It's silly, right? The goal-setting, ambitious, I want, I can, I will attitude is silly, right? No one would ever do that, right? I think in many ways, it's not that uncommon to forget who we are for real, to come to grips with our capacity, especially in reference to the future, and speak in a way that reveals that we've almost gone off the deep end. We're insane. We forgot reality. That's who James is speaking to today, not 11-year-old boys, not 14-year-old freshmen, but Christians, people who are out of touch with reality and are making statements about their future out of reference to the Lord's will. He says, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Right? This is what we're going to do. We're going to go there. We're going to spend a year there. We're going to make a profit. We're going to trade. Someone with business ambition and business expectation. They begin to make plans. And he goes on to say that when you make plans without reference to the Lord's will, you're ignoring the unpredictable nature of human existence. Look at what he says. Yet, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. You do not know. It's unpredictable what will take place tomorrow and into the future. Proverbs 27.1 uh, says this, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. That's a good reality check for us when we speak of things that we will do in the future without reference to the Lord's will. We're not able to control all the variables and the outcomes of our lives. 
we may think that if we just set a goal and just go about the process of reverse engineering the outcomes, then we will guarantee that outcome. Am I, am I right about that? He's saying you can't do that. We may think in our self-confidence that we can, but the reality is, is that we can't. We can't control the future. We can't reverse engineer every conceivable outcome to get the exact results that we want. We just can't do that. Plans with, made without reference to the Lord's will simply ignore the unpredictable nature of human existence. But not only that, James goes on to say this. He says, what is your life? What is it? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. What is your life? What metaphor would you use to describe the essence of your existence? He says, what is your life? Really? You speak in this way. You make plans in reference to the future. But do you understand the nature of human existence? I think of a despondent, despairing Christian who comes into my office discouraged, feeling worthless, depressed, purposeless, feels like their life is nothing. What kind of metaphor would you use in that moment to biblically counsel? Right, Someone comes into your office or into your life or sits at a coffee shop or in your living room or whatever in your house and those kinds of things come up. Appropriate encouragement like you are a child of the living God. You've been made in God's image. Your value is found in those things. Such dignity and worth and honor you have because you are in Christ. Accepted and beloved children of the Father. That's an appropriate biblical response. James in no way is trying to negate those perfect, fitting metaphors for those moments. But understand, as you understand what, what James is trying to correct, it's the prideful assumption that people have in their hearts that are manifested in their words. And so the metaphor that he uses to accurately describe the nature of human existence is fitting. He says, what is your life, O oh proud one, who thinks it's so significant? What is your life? He says, it's a mist. It's a mist. It's like a fog. He's saying, who do you think you are to make statements like that? What is your life? You think you're so significant? It's a mist. It's a fog. It's literally a puff in time. Job knew this. In the midst of his anguish, in the midst of his sorrows, and he said, I loathe my life. I would not live forever. Leave me alone, for my days are a breath. Isaiah spoke of these things in chapter 40 when he said this, All flesh is like grass, and its beauty like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen? When we make plans without reference to the Lord's will, we ignore the temporary nature of our earthly existence. Not just the unpredictable nature, but the temporary nature of it. Yes, we will live in eternity, but this earthly life, it's temporary. 
It's a mist. It's a fog. He goes on to say, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Even in that statement, we see the essence of human existence. Not only is it unpredictable, not only is it temporary, but human existence is a dependent one. If the Lord wills, we will do this or do that. If the Lord wills, if is introducing a conditional statement. If the Lord wills, we will. And you see a contrast already between two kinds of sayings that reveal two kinds of hearts. One speaks without reference to something that is absolutely necessary, that is primary upon which all willing is conditioned, the will of the Lord. We're a dependent people. In Him, we live and move and have our being. Amen? That's what human existence is. And He's saying when you speak like that, when you speak with such ambition, such self-confidence, such self-assurance, You're ignoring who you are. You're you're misunderstanding the limited capacity that you have. You're ignoring the fact that life is unpredictable, that it's temporary, and it is absolutely dependent on the Lord. And if you just want to roll it all up and say, well, what does all that mean? It means this. That plans that are made without reference to the Lord's will express the pride of our hearts. That's pride. That's what James is saying. All such boasting is evil. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. That's what you're doing. That's what's being revealed. That's what's coming out of the abundance of your heart. When you speak that way, when you live without reference to the will of the Lord, you're living a life, you're speaking a word that shows your pride. All such boasting is evil. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. See, that boasting is not the issue. He's not not prohibiting boasting, right? Let he who boasts, boast in the... Lord, it's what is boasted in. He said it's boasting in your arrogance. It's boasting in yourself. It's boasting in your own abilities, your gifts, your acumen, your strategic planning, your reverse engineering, your discipline, your focus, your hard work, your resolve, your reputation. The words that you say show the pride of your heart. That you're boasting in those things. Bravado. I want. I can. I will. Nothing will stop me. And some of you just felt a little like, man, I feel good when he says that. Because it taps into something in us, doesn't it? Yeah. I can. I like him. What's that? I'll write that one down. I want. I can, I will. That's the note of the day. That's the new mantra. Like, Because there's something about that that just grabs a hold of something inside of us that is twisted. The human nature. Right? We, some of us here may not struggle with this. Like, you know, like, listen, I think about today. I never think about tomorrow. I don't really care. I'm not a planning type. I just let life come to me. That doesn't make you more holy. Just saying. Right? That's a different kind of sin. But it all is pride. If you narrow it back down, it's pride in the human heart. The life that says, I don't need God. I can live without reference to his will. I can do it on my own without help. And you may be that kind of person struggling with these kinds of things today. Or even a believer that struggles 
just pride in your own heart, assuming you're better than you are, thinking you can do things uh, that you can't. That may be where you are today, wrestling in your soul about these things. And just know that's an issue of the heart. Those words that come out reveal an issue of the heart, the pride of life that is in the heart. John Flavel says this, there is no greater discovery of pride in the world than in the contests of our wills with the will of God. Just this contest that takes place. My will versus God's will. There's no, not a greater discovery of pride in the world than those things. Some of you are in this very contest right now, right here. I want to do it my way. I want to do it according to my timeline. And I'm only really interested in God if he's helping me get there. That is a life irrespective to the sovereign will of Almighty God. Remember, God opposes the proud, but what gives grace to what? The humble. It's a life lived in opposition to God. That's basically human history. Pride, people living without reference to the will of God, people setting up their own will, their own desire, their own vision, their own plans without reference to and with no interest in submitting to God's will. And that puts us in a precarious position in relationship to God, doesn't it? Right, Romans 3, is it 18? It says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. A long list of ways to describe the human condition that is at enmity with God, that is subject to his righteous wrath. God opposes the proud. So we wonder, as our pride is being revealed in our words, what hope do we have? What remedy do we have? What will be the antidote to the poison of pride in our hearts, a pride that is pervasive and manifests itself in innumerable ways, a pride that leads us to live a life without reference to the will of the Lord. Guess what the remedy is? The will of the Lord. The will of the Lord. A will that is actually more uh, powerful than ours. Amen? It was the will of the Lord to promise a redeemer in Genesis 3.15. When pride wreaked its ugly head and led to the fall of humanity, it was the Lord who said, I will. I will. Right? All of the I wills of the Old Testament are a clear revelation of what the Lord said he would do to deal with the predicament and pride in the human heart. And every I will of the Old Testament finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. So what is the remedy? It is the will of the Lord accomplished in Jesus. And even Isaiah 53, which I find to be one of the most paradoxical, confusing passages, and yet one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible. Isaiah 53, 10 and 11 says this, in that wonderful passage of the suffering servant, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. And look at this. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. No will of man will come in between, uh, uh, the, uh, will stand in the way of the will of God. Isn't that an amazing thing to think about? No human pride or collection of 
proud people could stand in the way of what God was going to do as he promised in Christ. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. It is in Christ that our pride is dealt with. Amen? It is in Christ, the one who humbly submitted himself, even in the midst of the agony of the Garden of Gethsemane, who said in prayer, with blood dripping down his, his brow in sweat, said, not my will, but yours be done. Do you remember that moment? The agony of Gethsemane. Because he knew that Golgotha was coming. But he said, in perfect humility and in servanthood, said, not my will, but yours be done. And our hope is in the one who finished the work. Amen? It is finished. God knows the proud will of the human heart. But God's will is more powerful. Amen? He willed our salvation. And that is the sweet remedy. For all the perils and poisons of human pride that must transform our heart. And so my plea with you today is to deal with this. You must be saved by the Lord. You must be saved. You must be saved by him in accordance with his will. You must be saved. So turn to him. All those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be saved from pride, shall be saved from a life of living without reference to the will of God, amen, shall be saved. All those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So call upon the name of the Lord, he alone who saves. Because of our pride, we must be saved by what the Lord did. We must also be saved by who the Lord is. And I wonder if one way that we could deal with the confusion about who we think we are and what capacities that we have is because we have not been in the presence of the, the God of the Bible. We've not come to know the glorious nature of his being. How do you cultivate humility in your heart that expresses itself in words, you come to know God. You see him in all of his grandeur. You see him in all of his glory. You come to know the, just the vastness of who he is. And when you do that, you see who you are relative to him. Amen? It's a wake-up call to come to know the God of the Scriptures. C.J. Mahaney, in his book on humility, says, if you want to cultivate humility in your life, study the incommunicable attributes of God. The incommunicable attributes of God are simply those attributes that he does not share with us, that we cannot identify with, that are so above and beyond that they just are his and his alone. And I wonder if even just a walking through this passage we see how God does not have the limitations that we have that keep us, as we come aware of it, keep us humble, right? While our knowledge is limited, we've already talked about that, right? Look back to 14, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. While our knowledge is limited, the Lord's knowledge is, knowledge is not. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. Do you know that? He knows everything about you. He, he sees all, all people, all, all things, all times, all places. He sees all from uh, eternity past, present, and eternity future. He knows everything. He knows. While we don't know what tomorrow will bring, God knows what tomorrow will bring. Amen? He foreknew it. He decreed it. 
While our life is temporary, the Lord is eternal. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Not so with the Lord. He's eternal. That's an incommunicable attribute. We are not eternal in the way that he is eternal. He is not a mist. He's not a fog. He's not a puff of air. He is the eternal God. Right? Revelation in the throne room. He's being praised. What? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is, and is to come. Amen? That's who he is. And while we are dependent beings, he is independent. Bobbing said this, that means this, that God is whatever he is by his own self and for his own self. He's independent. He's not dependent on any other thing other than himself. He is self-sufficient. We are not. We're scratching the surface. Look into these things more. Study the incommunicable attributes of God. It it will have a humbling effect. And when we know this God, when we understand that he knows everything, that he's eternal, that he's independent, we come to understand that his will is perfect. Perfect. His will is sovereign, right? And therefore, we humbly submit to it. Humbly submit. When we know who the Lord is, we humbly submit our lives to what the Lord wills. So that's the encouragement. Saved by what the Lord did in knowing who the Lord is. We humbly submit our lives to what the Lord wills. Look at what he says again. Instead, you ought to have said, we will do nothing. He did not say that, did he? So I want to be really careful here. In no way, shape, or form is James condemning plans. In no way, shape, or form is James condemning prophets. Some of the business guys are like, and women, are like, whew. It's not a sin to make a prophet. Someone say amen. I thought I'd get an amen out of that one. He's not condemning plans and prophets. Right? So make plans. Make prophets for the Lord. Make plans. Make prophets in reference to the Lord, who the Lord is, all that he's done. Make plans and prophets. Right? We said a couple weeks ago, William Carey, expect great things from God. That's first. We receive. But then he says what? Attempt great things for God. Some of us need to hear that. Because some of us have been hiding in a lack of vision, a lack of intentionality, a lack of speaking. I don't speak words of pride. That doesn't mean you're not proud. A lack of speaking, a lack of intentionality, a lack of planning, a lack of dreaming, a lack of vision for your family, your life, your ministry, your influence. Some of us are just stuck there saying, listen, I'm going to avoid all those sins by doing absolutely nothing with my life. That is not what the Lord has called us to. You are who you are. God has given you the resources he has given you to steward it for his glory. So make plans, make profits for the Lord. Amen? But secondly, submit your lives to the Lord. And I think that's the key. As Calvin says, fix your mind on his providence. He's in control. We don't know what tomorrow we bring. He will. So we say, if the Lord wills, this will happen. My life verse has been, many are the plans of a man's heart, but the Lord guides his steps. I wonder if that's a verse for you to think about today. Proverbs 19, 21. Many are the plans in the minds of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Make all the plans you want, brother, (laughs) sister. 
But know this, the purpose of the Lord will stand. Amen? That's good news, by the way, because his will is good. It's perfect. It's better. Do you believe that this morning? As you're making plans and submitting them to the Lord, what happens? Will it be better than your ideas and what you drummed up in your mind? Is it going to be better in the Lord? Are you going to try to think about what you think is better and try to go there and kind of live in opposition without reference to the will of the Lord? I heard somebody say recently about life. It never works out the way you thought, does it? And some of you might be living in that reality. It didn't work out the way you thought, did it? And I would love to spend 20 minutes on this, but I won't. But I actually think it's something we need to think about. Because nobody ever sits down with a whiteboard or a journal that they put in their briefcase. That was a little, that was free. And says, someday I'm going to suffer. Nobody says, I will plant a church that dies in two years. Nobody says that. Nobody says that. Nobody says, I'll live alone someday. Nobody says, I will receive rejection at work for reading my Bible at lunch, in the lunchroom. Nobody makes plans like, I'll, I will get cancer. Nobody makes those plans. But somehow in the midst of all that, the Lord wills. Right? Suffering seems to be, in whatever form, a disruption in the grandiose plans for our lives. I think we've all felt that in some varying degree. No one ever says, I'll su- I-, I will suffer with migraine headaches that debilitate my productivity levels. Right? The, 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 the suffering that we experience in this life feel like disruptions to the plan. And I wonder if that's where many of us are today. You're telling me my life is conditioned on the will of the Lord. You're telling me to submit my life to Him, and I've done that, brother. And all that I've had is the sour, bitter taste of struggle and suffering. That's a fair point, isn't it? All I've had is disappointment, Mike. And again, I think that there's some beauty and depth and purpose behind all of that. Because while we think that we know what our best future is, We can envision that. We can plan it out. We can visualize it. Our five-year, 10-year, 30-year plan. And we can work all we want to get there, to reverse engineer, to put the diligence in. We can rest in the fact that God has a better plan. He has a better purpose. And it's according to his divine will and purpose to use suffering to save. Right? You think back to the cross, the glory of the cross, the most brutal, horrific suffering imaginable led to our salvation. Could you have imagined anything better than that? Would you change a thing about what Christ has done for you? So now you think about your life. You might have imagined it a different way. And I pray the Lord would comfort you in that sorrow, comfort you in that pain, and that you would know his presence. 
But even on the other side, as the one who understands the way life works and sees their life by faith, I think you would conclude that as difficult as it has been, you could never have imagined it being this good too. With what God has done in you and through you in some of the most difficult disappointments and sorrows and suffering. You're sovereign over us, we sang. Right? Faithful forever. You are sovereign over us. He's at work. I think of my grandmother who recently passed and, and leading up to that as she struggled with the COPD and her heart and she can't breathe. And she said, I don't understand why the Lord would allow this. Why the Lord would will this. She said, but I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't change a thing. She understood that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Do you rest in that assurance today? This temporary earthly sorrow and suffering is just that. And there's great purpose behind it. And so even in the midst of our sorrows, and knowing that if they haven't come yet, they're coming around the corner, we can submit humbly our lives to the Lord. Amen? We've been saved by him. We know who he is. And so we are cured or are being cured of the pride of our hearts. And in some of the most concrete ways, we're speaking and living in a way that shows our humble submission to the Lord's will. If the Lord wills, we will do this or that. Let's pray together. Our Father, we praise you for Jesus who fully accomplished your will on the cross in our place for our sins. It is the work of grace that you did for us that humbles our heart and gives us such joy and peace and gratitude together. It's also knowing who you are in your glory. Father, I pray the Spirit of God would work in each heart here. May we be an ambitious people. May we set goals and make plans because we love you, because we are submitted to you, because you're doing a good thing in this world. Mobilize your people for those things. Empower us for a life of faithfulness that you've called us to. and Be glorified in all that we say and all that we do. In Christ's name, amen.